Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Sales Tech Deep Dive. And I'm joined today by my esteemed uh, colleagues and uh, partners in crime, Nicholas and Kyle with Clary. How are you doing today, guys? Doing just great. Living the dream, as always, David. Great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, we've seen a, a lot of consolidation happening in the sales technology space. And they're starting to be the emergent players. Um, Nicholas has some some nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> we them. Uh, we, but we like Craig Rosenberg uh, calls it the the alpha platforms that are that are forming. And um, we want to uh, get uh, Clary's take on this situation and uh, and really dive in and give people an understanding about how you guys think about this solution. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Nicholas, um, so you've been studying this industry for a long time. You came up with with our our deep dive structure and questions. So first and foremost, I just want to kick it off. Kyle, if you look at how the sales technology space is evolving, let's take it all the way back to the beginning of why was Clary initially started and what problem was being solved at the beginning? It's a great question, David. I'm, I'm glad you asked because it's important to start at the beginning. And the beginning for Clary was maybe about 10 or so years ago, which I think coincides with a lot of kind of the rise of rev tech. I think that was maybe 10 or 15 years ago is when things really started to, to take off, not to the extent of where they are today, but I think that was kind of a, a founding time for a lot of these companies. And Clary's main mission when we started was to solve the biggest pain point for every head of sales, every chief revenue officer, every single person who is running the revenue process, which was, are we going to hit our number? We're running this crazy bottoms up forecasting process that's you have to bounce between spreadsheets and BI tools and your CRM. And it's just a mess. It was as inefficient as it was ineffective. And revenue leaders were just banging their heads against the table saying, there's got to be a better way. And that's the main use case that Clary helped solve initially, not just forecasting. That was definitely a component of it. But in order to get this kind of revenue precision where you know where you're going to land with conviction, you have to have a good bottoms up forecasting process, but you also need really good retrospective analytics. You need predictive analytics based on machine learning and AI. And you need a single platform that allows sellers to run a governed methodology and manage their deals, You know, hopefully more similar than different in a way that doesn't require them to open a thousand different Salesforce tabs and get lost in between deal updates. And that's what Clary provided from the jump was all of these capabilities really focused on what at the time we called this magic triangle of reps, managers, and execs, and trying to uh, fill in all the various use cases that we needed to so that those folks could achieve that revenue precision month after month, quarter after quarter. Got it. So I think one, one aspect with, which was unique and, and still is by some extent is the approach, a workflow approach to running revenue. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure thing, yeah. So the kind of the broader headline here, Nicholas, is that a lot of companies thought of and in many cases still think of revenue as just an outcome that happens at the end of the quarter. It's a number, it's a metric that you report on. And the way that Clary has thought about revenue for you know 10 years now is it's a business process and not just any business process. It's the business process, the most important one. If you're not running revenue like a process, you're not going to be in business for too much longer. And so what does that mean? What does it mean for, for something to be a business process? It means there are component parts that can be broken down inspected and optimized. And each of those component parts of the revenue process are workflows. Some of those workflows are internal that are managed by reps, You know, a, a rep and a manager one-on-one. -on -one. That's a really important workflow. Some of them are a bit more complicated, like that bottoms up forecasting process that we talked about. Some are external, like buyer-seller collaboration and mutual action plans. But if you can run all, if you can identify and run all of these individual workflows internally and externally, and make sure that you're doing it in a standardized, governed way. This is how you can treat revenue like a process. And again, make sure that you are achieving consistent, predictable outcomes at the end of the quarter. Cool. And you have a, another concept that I always find uh, 
I will say fascinating. So it might not be the word, but this uh, three-headed hydra. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The three-headed Hydra. Uh, so a lot of those workflows that I just talked about, and I alluded to this before, prior to Clary, or for companies that don't have Clary, they're trying to run a lot of these workflows in point solutions or CRM system or spreadsheets or places that frankly just weren't purpose-built to run those workflows end-to-end. -end. And the three-headed Hydra that we talk a lot about is BI, so business intelligence systems, CRM, and spreadsheets. And it's that monster that operations teams and sales leaders just get totally lost in and frustrated by. And it's the main enemy that we're trying to replace. We're saying there has to be a better way. And if you have a purpose-built solution to run revenue and to run these workflows, you don't need to get lost in those spreadsheets, lost in CRM, bouncing between BI tools that you have no idea how to use. And, and that's what Clary is trying to solve. <laughs> And in that initial, the initial value proposition, is that what really resonated with buyers or was there a pivot or something different that uh, ended up saying, okay, this is really taking off? It's a great question, David. So initially, kind of in the earlier years at Clary, the value prop that I just talked through was the one that was really resonating. It was, I, I mentioned before, that magic triangle of reps, managers, and leaders all mostly on the new logo side, frankly, new business acquisition that were focusing on using Clary. And the shorthand that they use was, we rely on Clary for forecasting. And as I mentioned, of course, by forecasting, they really mean broader than that. It's not just the roll up, it's also the analytical understanding of the business. But as time has, had gone by, we started to see more and more different personas across the revenue org starting to use Clary in ways that we didn't really design it for, and we were happy to see. And so kind of the most logical thing that we saw was post-sales personas, whether that's an account manager or a customer success manager, starting to use Clary on the renewal and expansion side, the same way that individual account executives and reps and managers use Clary on the new logo side. So adding as much rigor to churn forecasting, you know, every company should assign itself a churn budget every quarter and work toward that budget the same way you're working toward new logo acquisition. Um, and so we're, we started to see companies inventing new use cases. And we thought to ourselves, man, this, this concept of, of revenue, it affects the entire company, obviously, but maybe half, two thirds, you tell me how many employees at a company are truly revenue critical and need to understand how what the work that they're doing impacts the bottom line. So we started to see people from finance, from marketing, from product, from engineering, starting to log into Clary so that they could see on the, let's just use product as a non-traditional example. I want to go into Clary. I want to look at pipeline. I want to look at the funnel by product line so that I can see I'm not just a product manager. I'm a general manager of my business and revenue matters just as much as shipping features. And so we started to see this revenue oriented mindset for so many different what we now call revenue critical employees that are not just on the go-to-market side, but across the entire business. And that's the way that we've been trying to shift now as we think about our product strategy and our roadmap, our acquisition strategy, all those things is what can we do to deliver a more robust solution to all the various members of your company that care about revenue? And that's a lot of people. Yeah. Yes. So you you mentioned acquisitions. <laughs> You've done a, a few lately. You You've acquired Groove, which was, uh, I mean, the, the market took note. <laughs> but maybe you can walk us through the, the various acquisition and how it, it, it expanded the, uh, the, the product footprint, the, the solution suite, whatever you call it, to where it is today. Sure thing. So uh, uh, three years ago, uh, I mentioned that one of the founding principles of Clary was we just have to make deal management easier. I think you two know, every rep who's listening to this knows that managing deals out of Salesforce is just a pain in the neck. Um, and so we we made that process a lot easier by giving a really useful, clean interface for reps to manage deals. And we were you know, doing what we do, talking to customers, understanding what they needed. And they said to us, boy, it'd be great if we could collaborate with our buyers the same way that we can collaborate internally in this view that Clary has. And we thought, okay, very interesting. And so we looked across the market. We, of course, looked at our internal R&D team and ultimately decided acquisition is the right path here for mutual action plans and digital sales rooms. And that was the first acquisition that we did, a company that was formerly known as DealPoint. We now call Clary Align. And that is everything that sellers need to collaborate with their buyers 
for in-flight deals, implementation, post-sales, uh, account management, all those types of things. And then the interface is just right there, a single click from the same opportunity inspection sort of table that Clary offered before. So that was the first acquisition. I'll, I'll pause there. Any questions or comments about that? No, I, I'm, 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 I didn't know that uh, it expanded to include digital sales room and all the process of sharing content, the photo content, not just the step of a, an action plan. So very interesting. That's right. That's right. So moving, go ahead, David. One, one quick comment is I was actually one of the initial customers of DealPoint um, with, with Tom when he was Tom. First launching it. Yeah. And it was, it was just, it really was useful for being able to understand throughout the deal cycle, were we delivering on our commitments to the customer? And we have, and just like it sounds, a mutual action plan moving forward. So it's interesting that, you know, you, you heard that feedback that that would be useful. And then it just happened that that that, that was out there. And, you know, we were using prior to acquiring DealPoint, we were using spreadsheets for yeah. mutual action plans, the same way that many companies do. And of course, what happens is they either don't get used or they get completely bastardized by the rep who has their own style or however they want to do things. And it becomes really hard to standardize and to scale. And so by having that technology in our software, it was night and day to see conversion rates improve and standardize, win rates start to improve, all those types of things. Not to mention how much the buyers enjoy that experience. The buyer needs to be shepherded along. A lot of sales reps expect the buyer to do a lot of work on their behalf. And to a certain extent, they have to. You have to make that as easy for them as possible. And that's what these digital sales rooms can do. That's what these mutual action plans can do. So that was kind of the, found, the, the thesis of that first acquisition. Last year in 2022, we acquired a company called Wingman, conversation intelligence company, now known as Clary Copilot. Why did we do that? We looked across the landscape. Again, this is mostly based on customer feedback. Pretty much everything we do from a product standpoint is based on customer feedback and what people want and what they're asking for. What we heard from them was, yeah, you know, we have a call recording solution, but it's kind of, it sits outside of our workflow. It basically is, we're paying a lot just to have a library of recorded calls. And we thought to ourselves, okay, how can we improve that experience? We understand there's a lot of value in having that library of recorded calls, of course, but that value compounds in significantly when those call recordings are surfaced in the workflows that reps, managers, execs have. So when you're doing a one-on-one -on -one rep manager and you're doing a deal inspection, the call recording from Copilot surfaces right there in Clary. When you're doing a forecast call and your CRO is asking, what's the real health of this deal? She can look right at the call recording hear the snippet from the customer's mouth and have a good sense of whether or not this deal is actually coming in this month. And so we have all everything that you would expect from a call recording solution. But now what's really exciting is the way that this product suite is really integrating together so that all of these workflows kind of clarity core, plus now these mutual action plans, plus all these call recordings and conversational intelligence, seeing it all come together, it's amazing how much compounding value there is for all of the users. Um, so that was 2022. I'll, I'll pause again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to make one comment is there's conversations and there's intelligence and it's putting them together because if you've got a huge library of conversations, but it's not necessarily in the workflow. And I, I feel like workflow has been a theme so far in <laughs> getting this into the workflow. If those aren't uh, baked in, then it, they're just not as useful as they could be. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, this is why I started on this topic of workflow. I've heard you guys sometimes use the term cadence. Yep. Uh, we we tend to think historically clarity equal forecasting, and we think of it as the job of revenue ops. Right. <laughs> and what I like, which I think is very fresh, is first to look at it. Uh, you you call this golden triangle: the reps, the manager, and the execs. And to think of it, thinking of it of a workflow with its ramification beyond just the uh, the number you're going to shoot for <laughs> or publish. Uh, very interesting. And I'm glad you brought up the, the RevOps side of the house, Nicholas, because RevOps is so fascinating. First, it's the fastest growing job in America this year. Did you guys know that? Literally, the according to CNBC, this is not Clary propaganda. According to CNBC, <laughs> revenue operations, the number one fastest, faster than frontline healthcare workers, faster than truck drivers, faster than anything else, revenue operations. Why? Why is that? 
because RevOps is the strategic growth driver at all of these companies. They're the ones that are running, that are really facilitating the way that you can run revenue like a business process. Uh, introduce, evaluate, integrate, administer all the technology that you need to make sure that your reps can do the things that they need to do at scale and unlock growth for the company. And so we we always are thinking about that RevOps persona as well, because they're critical, critical. It's not just a back office role. It's not. When it's talked about that way, it's a complete disservice to the whole function. It really is the right-hand person of the CRO. And what's really interesting, guys, is we've seen this trend in the last couple of years where heads of RevOps are now becoming chief revenue officers. Whereas in the past, that path to CRO was really mostly through a VP of sales type persona. We're starting to see way more operations folks take on that role because they know the numbers, they know the analytics, they know the processes, and they can they inspire a lot of confidence with the executive team that they can facilitate that kind of growth and predictability. Okay. Maybe we should fast forward to a few weeks ago Maybe yeah. barely a month. <laughs> barely a month. Your latest acquisition. This one is uh, is um, uh, um, breaking a little bit beyond <laughs> the traditional market. So <laughs> indeed, indeed. So uh, on mid August, late August, we acquired Groove. Groove is one of the top lead. It is one of the leaders in sales engagement, um, and you're likely familiar with some of the other players in the space: Outreach, Sales Loft, um, th those types of companies. And we started to evaluate Groove for many of the same reasons I mentioned before. We were interacting with a lot of customers and they said, gosh, we're getting so much value out of Clary. It would be amazing if we could take action right from Clary instead of having to hop over to our, our email client or you know use one of these other vendors. And so we, start, we had a partnership already with Groove and we had a really nice API integration. But bringing these companies together, the vision of it, which is... In flight right now, we've shipped a handful of integrations, but the fuller platform integration is coming soon. The full vision is we want to create this closed loop between the insights that you get from Clary and Clary's revenue database and all the beautiful uh, data that we have and are collecting from the various revenue applications I talked about, all the insight there. There needs to be a closed loop with the action that you can take because what happens, guys, is let's go back to one of the most common workflows. You're in a rep and manager one-on-one. -on -one. The rep and the manager are discussing a deal. They identify a handful of things to do. Do those things ever actually get done? Did you send that email to the CFO to engage them? Did you multi-thread with XYZ persona? Hopefully you did, but there's not a ton of governance or accountability that you actually get that done because it exists outside of the workflow. We have a vision, and that's just one example. There are many, but we have a vision where rep manager one-on-one, -on -one, you're having this conversation. You're, the insights are coming both from the people that are saying, here's what we think needs to happen, but also from the technology, Clary saying, hey, there's deal risk here. There's momentum here. Here's a suggested action for you to take. That insight is surfaced, and then the action is taken immediately in the flow of work. So that's deal inspections, forecast calls, whatever it may be, there needs to be that closed loop between insight and action. And that's what Groove allows us to do. It's not just about top of funnel prospecting. That's an important part, of course. It's also about deal management, account management, customer relationships, all of those types of things. And to be able to execute all that inside a single platform is really, really powerful for folks. The next thing I'll say from a vision standpoint is pipeline is a black box right now for most sales leaders. They invest a lot in it. They've got an army of SDRs that are meant to produce it. If you ask them, how much pipeline are you going to create this quarter? They have no idea. And if they do know, they have no idea how it's going to get created. And so the value of bringing Groove together with Clary on top of what I just discussed with the workflows is this analytical capability where Clary has all the predictive machine learning and predictive AI that says, here's what's going to happen in the future. And now, instead of that prediction mostly being about opportunity to close, now it's going to be about pipeline creation. So we have a, in a single view, sales leaders are going to be able to see Here's how much pipeline you're likely to create based on how many leads or accounts you have engaged in outbound flows. Here is uh, coverage against revenue. Here's a potential gap. And here's an action you need to take. Add 200 new accounts to this, to this flow. And you can take that action right there. So it's going to be this always on cycle of insight and action getting close to real time. Okay. So can you, now that we, we went through all the, uh, the acquisition can you portray uh, what you call now the, the Clary 
uh, revenue platform uh, in its entirety. And uh, uh, so Gartner has coined this term of a uh, sales execution hub. I don't know if you relate to this concept, but uh, how you play, um, um, I think, give us the, the big picture view of yeah. all the pieces all together. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So we we call ourselves the revenue platform. That's what a lot of our customers just refer to us as. And we said, yeah, that has a nice ring to it. It's general enough to be encompassing of all the things we do, um, but it's specific enough so that people kind of know what it is, hopefully. Um, so Clary is a revenue platform. And I, I've used a lot of these phrases before, so forgive me for being repetitive, but it is a platform that really is purpose-built to run revenue, to execute all of those internal and external workflows for all revenue critical employees from the BDR to the boardroom. We have indiv individual BDRs, SDRs, whatever, that are using Clary day to day. We have board executives that are logging in and managing their companies inside of Clary and everything in between. And that for us is what a true revenue platform delivers is that kind of value. And it's not just a box checking exercise, Nicholas, where we say, yeah, we have conversation intelligence and yeah, we have sales engagement. And there needs to be breadth of capabilities, but depth of capabilities as well. So as companies are thinking about consolidating, as companies are looking across their sales tech, rev tech stack and saying, man, we have a lot of point solutions. You can't, you, you may want to consolidate, but you can't compromise. And what I've heard from a lot of operations people and sales leaders is they say, we thought we were spending a lot on tech. So we pulled the plug on a handful of things and we broke our go-to-market system because we thought that we could get away with having, you know, this 40, 50% solution from some other vendor, and it just wasn't good enough. And so what we are, are really focused on is ensuring that we have depth across all those key capabilities that I talked about, forecasting, rev ops, sales engagement, CI, mutual action plans, data capture, all the things that revenue teams really need all under one roof. Okay. You know, it's hard to have a, a discussion these days without asking a question about AI in general and generative AI. So now is the time for you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know the drill, but uh, tell us how you you're trying to. Uh, and of course, it was at the uh, at, at the very beginning uh, this entire concept of letting the the machine <laughs> build the forecast. But um, uh, tell us a little bit where AI plays and uh, what, what a strategic investment you're making in that field. 100%, Nicholas. And, and people are um, rightly so very wrapped up in generative AI. That's one flavor of AI. And there's a lot of other types of AI that are useful, especially in a, in a platform like ours. And probably my favorite, my favorite story about this is we have a customer CFO who uh, every quarter, she issues a challenge to all of her VPs of sales. And, and last I checked, there were six of them. So six VPs of sales. And she says, if you can beat the Clary call this quarter, I owe you a bottle of wine. If you <laughs> do not beat the Clary call this quarter, you owe me a bottle of wine. And consistently every quarter, she's got six bottles of wine on her desk <laughs> waiting for her. I think there was one time where one of the VPs got lucky, had some Bluebird deal come in that made his call better than the Clary call. But it's 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 that kind of AI that uh, Clary was really founded on, like really being smart about the, looking at your, your CRM history, looking at all the data, building really comprehensive machine learning models in order to uh, provide those predictive analytics that companies need. If you're a private company, you need accountability. You need to be able to uh, run your revenue process with precision. And using Clary's AI uh, forecast call as one of the data points. You, you know, of course, there's always a triangulation. Human intelligence plus artificial intelligence is typically the best pathway. Um, but if you're a public company, my gosh, the stakes are even higher. And we have this whole portfolio of public companies that are guiding the street using and leveraging a lot of Clary's AI from a predictive standpoint. So predictive AI is something that we were founded on. It'll continue to be a major investment. And I, I mentioned in passing this revenue database that we have that's powering our entire platform. We're snapshotting your every customer's CRM every 15 minutes, building this unbelievable database of time series data that's powering a lot of the, the machine learning and AI models that we have. No other company does this. So our predictive models are much more robust than anybody else's, which is why they're more accurate. The AI, machine learning, it's all about the data set that you have, garbage in, garbage out. We do not have garbage. We have comprehension and therefore we have trustworthy results. So that's the predictive side. Generative side, 
we this was part of the uh, deal thesis with acquiring Wingman, now known as Clary Copilot, is we needed that conversation data. We needed it for NLP, we needed it for descriptive AI, and we needed it obviously for generative AI. And so now we have this whole universe of millions of recorded calls that we can run all these AI models against. And in March, we launched our Rev AI capabilities, which is smart meeting summaries, uh, smart battle card summaries, all, all these different ways that just right in the platform, just making reps lives a lot easier so that they don't have to go and listen to the 45 minute call and tease out the three bullet points. AI can do that for them. And things like that, just to increase increase productivity. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg with the generative things that we're working on. We have a lot more coming down the pike. I'm glad you touched on, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you mentioned something interesting earlier in, um, as you're uh, gathering all this information, then it comes back down to the re uh, relationship with the sales manager and the rep and how they're going through the results and talking about how to improve. And you touched on a little bit um, using AI or, or, you know, the information to help the manager to improve the performance of their reps. So is that something that you're looking at uh, to, to develop? Always, David. We, we believe that collaboration between and among revenue critical employees is critical. If you're not effectively collaborating, things fall off the rails pretty quickly. Reps don't get what they need or managers don't get what they need or people feel like they're growing apart and you're not running deals the same way from rep to rep and that can cause other issues as well. So there have to be ways to foster collaboration. And so kind of Powered by our, our tech, Clary's technology, but outside of it is something that Nicholas mentioned, this concept that we have of the revenue cadence. And well, what is a revenue cadence? It's effectively a blueprint for how to run every day, every week, and every month of the quarter. What are the things that you have to do every day as a revenue team, every week, every month? How can you make sure that you have all these revenue moments correctly cadenced out throughout the quarter so that nothing slips through the cracks? And we have a whole playbook. If you're interested in seeing it, um, you can just Google the Clary Revenue Cadence playbook and you can see how our company's thinking about different types of deal inspection, rep and manager one-on-ones, pre-sales workflows, post-sales workflows, and everything in between. And then you can sort of cobble together your own cadence based on the best practices that you see from many of our customers outlined in that playbook. Awesome. So how many customers you have now total? Somewhere near 1,600. Oh, wow. So we, you touch, I'm glad you touch on the revenue DB because it's uh, a key part of the differentiation and we touch on a few other things. Um, are there other elements of your differentiation that we haven't touched? The, there are, <laughs> it depends on who we're differentiating against Nicholas because we're, we're in a sort of fortunate... Uh, we're Someone fortunate, in the back. <laughs> in the back, behind you, behind you. Um, That's my you know, background. What's, <laughs> what's interesting about it, Nicholas, is a, a, lot of the, a lot of the competition that we have, frankly, are status quo. As okay. I mentioned before, it's, it's companies that so are trying to... Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, BI tools, data marks. CRM. Yeah. Exactly. And so we, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we understand what those workflows are, and we're providing purpose-built technology to run those workflows. And so it's so it's it's so funny. Every time we demo to a revenue operations person or or a sales leader and we just show them, here's our here's how we approach forecasting. Their jaw drops and like, oh my God, you just gave me my Sunday back. And we're like, yeah, that's that's <laughs> what this is. Like it's not a week long exercise to do a forecast roll up. We have I was actually just at dinner with uh, one of the senior operations people at Palo Alto Networks. They've been a design partner of ours and a customer of ours for, I think, nine years now. And he's running a team across all of Europe. I think it was something like 2,600 reps or something like that. And he said that his forecast, his bottoms up forecast process takes one hour. And I was like, what? That's incredible. He's like, yeah, we have it completely streamlined. Reps know when they need to give the update. Managers know when that update comes in. VPs approve. I send it off to the CRO. It takes an hour. I asked him, how long did it take you before Clary? And he had a, almost a nervous breakdown. He said, it took almost two weeks to do this kind of thing at a previous company before they had Clary. I'm not surprised to hear that. And so a lot of the, a lot of the competition we see, Nicholas, is, is folks that are trying to focus on those kind of workflows that if they cannot execute well, they're not going to last super long at the company. Um, 
we can talk more about the, the more literal rev tech competition if you'd like, but that's the main competition we come up against. Well, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm starting to like you less because you're taking all the fun. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> weekly series of meetings. <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you, Dave. No, I, I, I'm just curious. Um, you know, at the at the uh, top end of the funnel, you've got the marketing automation platforms that are feeding into the the sales hub that you're creating, and then you've got the CRM on the background, which is sort of a, a file cabinet at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So wh where where do you see, is there expansion potentially into either a CRM or even further up the funnel? Maybe, David, maybe. And that's that's a little, that's kind of a long ways off. But we we see a universe potentially where this revenue database that we have, our unified data layer, could potentially replace a CRM for some workflows. Not we, we we haven't talked about CPQ. We haven't talked about territory management. We haven't talked about those types of things yet, and those are critical. And and many companies still run those out of out of CRM. And so, will we ever fully replace everything that a CRM can do? Probably not. There's a reason Salesforce is what 160 billion market cap. What's what's their market cap? I don't even know. <laughs> so if they can't do it, that you can plug in the app exchange. Right. <laughs> so yeah. That, that makes sense. So um, thinking of what next, how would you typically, when you, you run into a, a customer, they, in most cases, they're starting bite size with elements. So what do you tell them in terms of rolling out this suite? What steps, what recommendation? How do you approach the next steps? It's a great question, Nicholas, and it's something we're we're sort of wrestling with right now with the group acquisition being so so fresh. Sort of the blessing and the curse of the extensibility of our platform is there are a million different combinations of pathways and personas and and ways to start a conversation or start an evaluation. And so the answer to this question and every good question is it depends. It depends what the customer needs. It depends on the personas that are engaged. We see we have deals that start with sales engagement and move into CI. We have deals that start with forecasting and move into sales engagement and everything in between. Um, so we we what we're trying to do is we're trying to be as empathetic as possible with what do the buyers really need? Where are the brightest burning fires in their revenue process? And what can we help with most immediately? We're not necessarily always trying to just land with the largest possible ASP for Clary. We know that this is a journey. We know that there are, and we, and we also know that times are somewhat tough right now. And we want to prove that there's value, not just in our technology, but in our partnership and the way that we think about running revenue and the way that we can help them in a consultative sort of way, just be smarter ab about and across the revenue process. So it's up to the customer uh, how they want to start. And we see people start with various elements of our platform. That's great. Well, th they've made a ton of progress over the last few years. And Kyle, um, you know, is there anything that we haven't covered that you're excited about that's being developed now um, that people should look out for? There, so something I'm really excited about, David. Well, two things. One is I know uh, many folks in your audience and, and many folks know me for you know more top of funnel type things. We just launched the Clary Prospecting Academy, which is a free resource for anybody who wants it. Again, you can just Google it, Clary, Clary Prospecting Academy. And it's uh, led by me. So apologies in advance. You have to spend a lot of time with me. Six video courses on cold email, cold calling, account plans, video messaging, uh, organization, SDR metrics, all those types of things. So if you're interested in that, Clary Prospecting Academy. On the product side, there is this really interesting move that many companies are making toward consumption-based revenue models. So they're not necessarily charging for licenses the way that you know traditional SaaS companies are priced. They're charging for how much usage are you actually getting out of the company? So think about something like uh, Uber for business, as an example. They'll sign an agreement with a large company that says, you're going to pay us per ride that your employees take. That's a totally different way of managing your revenue process. And that requires a completely different solution for revenue forecasting and analytics and all the rest. 
And so launching sometime this quarter, we're in alpha right now with a handful of customers. We will have a comprehensive solution to for that consumption or usage-based revenue model. And I'm really, really excited about that because it's such a big pain point. I think something like five years ago, this revenue model existed at maybe 10%, 12% of companies. Fast forward to today, it's something like 40 or 50% of companies have a usage-based revenue model or are planning to in the next one to two years. And so it's a major pain point. If we can solve it, we're going to be adding a ton of value to our customers. And I'm pretty confident we're going to solve it. And and just to clarify for myself is, and I just got the name finally after all these years, Clary, clarify. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that solution that you're describing could be useful for a small business that has just a handful of sales reps and they can't afford the probably the premium package that, uh, you know, has evolved. So is am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely, David. That's been actually one of the other benefits of this acquisition path that we've been on is extending our use cases to be um, as valuable to small companies as they are to large companies for whatever it may be. Like many companies will start with, you know, maybe they don't need as much rigor or visibility into the forecasting process because they're only managing 10 deals at a time. They've got eyes on every single one of those deals. But as soon as, you know, you get to some critical mass of opportunities, you need some sort of purpose-built technology. Um, but now Clary has solutions for people that are right out of the gates, whether you need uh, outbound capabilities or you need uh, a call recording capabilities, whatever it may be, and whatever revenue model you're running as well. So I, I think that there's extensibility for super small companies, for Fortune 100 companies, and everybody in between. It's brilliant. And this is my last question: Are you primarily focused on the software industry as far as your your customer base and track record, or you know, is it across multiple industries? It's a great question. Uh, early on in Clary's life, yes. We were focused mostly on tech. Maybe in the last five or six years, we've seen a pretty significant shift into financial services, business services, professional services, uh, healthcare, life sciences, those types of companies. And this acquisition of Groove opens up a whole new can of worms for us to go and explore because there's just so many use cases for sales engagement standalone at more traditional industries. So we feel like we're in a really good spot. I don't know if we have as a you know revenue platform fully cross the chasm yet but we're pretty darn close if we haven't well it looks like um nicholas will have to update update his map at some <laughs> point <laughs> in the next in the next year or two um kyle thank you so much for coming on and and diving in um nicholas how uh, do you have any other questions for kyle no, that's uh, thank you so much for spending so, time yeah. with us and uh, our viewers uh, explaining. Um, so uh, we keep on watching you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, guys. Thanks again for having me. Great interest. Thank you, Kyle.